Hello, everybody. Just going to share my screen with the paper. All good? Um, yep. I chose, uh, by the way, as I, as I present, I have only one screen here. I won't see your faces. So if you have questions, just interrupt and, and speak out, please. Or, or you can write it in the chat and then maybe someone will read it. How are we doing? Uh, yeah, thanks, Peter. So basically, I chose this paper, but I, I came across this paper of, on LinkedIn because I follow one of the authors. And they're all Armenian, as you can see from names, maybe. Um, and it's a very interesting paper because it's quite similar to the work we did at Empla a couple of years ago. But this is much more elaborate and uh, better. So I thought it's quite interesting to, to go over it. Uh, the basically the idea is that they optimize, they create, but they generate molecules using LLMs. And they, besides just the generation, they also optimize the molecules for certain properties. I don't want random molecules. You want a molecule that's valid, but also satisfies certain properties that can cure drug, that can create uh, drugs to cure diseases and whatnot. Um, so, to do that, uh, there are basically two main steps, and maybe maybe four, let's say four, because they put four points here in the contributions, right? The first one is uh, curating a data set for fine-tuning. Uh, so, they actually created a pretty large data set from PubChem, uh, and they, they said more, more than 110 million molecules. Uh, they generate the SMILES representations, which is basically a, a molecule representation as a, as a text. Okay, I'll show you uh, the examples later. They, they have, actually the paper is very detailed. They give so many details. Every little thing is detailed. They, they made everything publicly available also, which is really cool. So anyway, they generate this data set, uh, which then they use to uh, fine-tune uh, specialized LLMs like Chem Lactica uh, and Chema. So those are already trained on chemical data sets. And then they further fine-tune those models, those LLMs on SMILES uh, data sets. And by the way, these models are fairly small, like 125 million, which is fairly small for current models. Even the big million parameter is also small, right? But as you will see, as you will see later in the experiments, the smallest model does really well, which I think is really cool because we want to use smaller models if we can, right? Uh, the other interesting thing is that uh, they optimize the generated um, molecules by running through a genetic sort of a genetic algorithm, which uses prompt optimization, right? So there are interesting things here besides the molecule path because. These days, we always try to optimize prompts, uh, and there there have been a, well, there has been work that uses sort of genetic algorithms to optimize prompts, like the one from Google DeepMind optimizing. Uh, so that they solve these uh, Olympia pro, pro problems, right? They also optimize prompts. So it's a, it's a common technique also to use to get the best prompts you can, and then they use similar approach, kind of simpler maybe, to, opti to, to optimize the prompts to generate the right types of uh, molecules. Uh, as they do that, of course, there are, there are experiments. They beat the benchmarks uh, by a pretty significant uh, margins, but there are a few nuances. Again, we look at the tables later. Uh, but the highlight is that they actually outperform pretty, pretty well. Um, and they also introduced this efficient fine-tuning part. So basically, it, they say we fine-tune the models only if necessary. Okay. So there is a trained model, but then they also fine-tune on specific examples uh, only when the optimizer doesn't improve at some point. Right? It's, we don't want to, which is kind of strange because I thought you would fine-tune on all data at the beginning, uh, but then they fine-tune iteratively on very few uh, very few data points, maybe like 100 data points. Uh, again, we look at this, I like a bit of a discussion about this part also. That was a bit new to me. Okay. Any comments so far? 
Cool? No? Okay. Um, related work, um, well, representing uh, language models for molecular representation is not new. SMILES is a very old algorithm, uh, well, not algorithm, but representation of molecules from 1988. You can see there, there has been also newer work. I wish they cited the plan paper, but they didn't. Uh, but there has been other work uh, using LLMs uh, or language models uh, for molecular representation. Uh, molecular optimization also um, is a common, uh, is a fairly popular topic, especially G flow nets. Uh, I think we had this at Pepper Club. Uh, they also uh, use G flow nets on molecular optimization. Uh, it's also cool work. Uh, I think we, have, we had this at Emplan before, at Paper Club before. They also mentioned this uh, RNNs, reInvent. It's a fairly old uh, algorithm, but there is also a newer version of those uh, that use uh, RNNs for a molecule design, molecule generation. Uh, can, because if you can represent, because SMILES is basically a, a sequence, so maybe you can generate molecules also using an RNN. And these days, RNNs are becoming more and more popular. Uh, maybe we can do a XLSTM at some point at the paper club. Anyway, um, and then they also talk about optimizing, optimizing, uh, L losing LLMs in optimization. So they do mention a few papers here, uh, like how to um, optimize using an LLM. I mentioned uh, the prompt optimization paper. There are a few other works here. Um, again, very cool, useful direction. Uh, there is one package called um, DSPY, DSPY, uh, which basically optimizes, uh, helps you optimize your prompts. That's actually quite, can be quite interesting. So this topic is also an interesting topic. Okay. So this paper is a combination of a few kind of diverse, but uh, very useful and popular topics. Okay. Comments here? Okay. So let's look at the training corpus. It looks like they spent a lot of time and effort creating this corpus. Uh, uh, so they took this data from PubChem, um, which is a data set of molecules, and then they curated that, they calculated properties like QED, is a, com uh, is a commonly used molecule property. Uh, there's a couple of others here. Uh, don't need to go into details, but there is a lab package called RDK that can do these calculations for you. So they use that to generate the properties. And, all, and they also uh, created a JSON representation. Right? If you look here at the examples, so they have these square brackets uh, for each uh, property. So you start with the properties of your uh, molecule, uh, and then you put the smile representation. So this is the smile representation of a molecule. So the chemi chemical, uh, this is basically a molecule, right? You can see the connection type, and those are the atoms. Okay. And then, then you can have, uh, and then followed by other properties, which this we will. Uh, no, this we will also generate. Uh, and then there is a similarity score, uh, which, which calculates the similarity from this molecule to another molecule, this uh, from the current molecule to this one. Right? So you want to put the similarity here, which I find a bit interesting because it sounds like the, the LLM generate a similarity number. But I won't, I won't uh, someone to correct me if I'm wrong here, because that would be strange, right? Why would you let LLM generate a similarity number? Well, I think that's what happens. The, the number is a metric as well, right? It's like you can, yeah. you can use some kind of package to calculate the similarity. Yes, exactly. You can calculate this, but I think it, I think they, some, they generate that. Not in the corpus, but okay. with the molecule generation. I do remember somewhere later in the paper, they're generating similar molecules as a way mm. to the genetic algorithm yeah exactly yeah for the genetic algorithm you need the similarity metrics there yeah um and then they have a few other uh, properties here so this is a property that you want to satisfy right so you want to generate a molecule 
like this that satisfies this property. Okay, uh, that's really the ultimate goal. Okay, uh, the CID is a is a identifier, not very important. Okay, um, I think we can scroll down to the training part. So model training, uh, they use the um, they, they did this continuous pre-training, which they call it a um, model training, but this is really continuous pre-training, which means you take the existing models, um, uh, diff different sizes, and they continue training with, this, with the original objective, but on new data. Kind of fine-tuning, but continual training. Okay. Um, they describe here the tokenization, they introduce new tokens, uh, which makes sense. Um, they, in, they introduce special tokens uh, to have the um, um, end of uh, EOS, is like the end, end of sentence tokens. So you need to introduce some tokens, yeah. Was there a comment? No, I'm just agreeing with you, Edson. Oh. And the sentence. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, training methodology. Oh, yeah, they use the standard things like flash attention. Uh, this uh, fully sharded data parallel training also, so they can feed the models on uh, smaller GPUs. But that I don't think they need this because they had the H one hundred and A one hundred, as you can see, and the models are fairly small. So I'm not sure why they need this data. Parallel. I guess they have lots of data. because of the size of the data set. Yeah, fine. Because um, when we were doing um, the work and we were using like a seven billion parameter model, no, we were using a half a billion parameter model, but a hundred thousand mm -hmm. data points. It took like a day. So if they're mm -hmm. using like a hundred and ten million, that's that would take a hundred days unless they do some kind of parallelization. Right, so they can feed more data uh, on the same GPU. Yeah, they can have larger batches, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. That's, but 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 then, it, but you don't want large batches, right? You want smaller batches, but trained in at the same time, like normal sized batches, but trained in parallel, as if you have many GPUs. I think that's what that's what they want, because if you, you can just increase the batch and feed everything at the same time, but that won't perform well. So I think that's why they do that, uh, data parallelism. Um, I think those are the yeah, those are the main two main things. They they also talk about the uh, the the uh, floating point sixteen and so on. So they give a lot of details. Yeah, that's, that's I find that pretty cool. Um, so property prediction, right? So uh, the evaluation is done on. The, the, they evaluate the model's performance on its ability to predict uh, properties. And then they use this uh, mean, uh, root mean squared error to measure performance. Yeah. Um, so you give a smart string and then you generate property like QED, and then you, you, you measure is QED. Well, first of all, is the molecule valid? And second, is the QED close to the, to the correct QED? So they, they will allow, so they want to, they fine-tune the model in, in a way that it can um, it can uh, predict the properties accurately. Okay? Uh, they use a few techniques like chain of thought. This was interesting, actually. This, the way they do chain of thought is they say we skip the uh, start smiles bit, so we to, to allow more properties generated before smiles gen generated. Right? Uh, this, that's kind of a chain of thought. Um, which I found interesting. Uh, so you, you don't know when exactly you start generating the actual molecule, right? You do some more properties and then, and then you do the, um, uh, the molecule. It's cool. Um, uh, desired. Right. So then they, they, uh, suspend on the suspend on desired uh, tokens and so on. So those are maybe not as, um as special um yeah one thing i didn't really like i think the paper maybe was a bit rushed because these tables 
don't really have any explanations. Right? That's a bit because then you read the table, then you have to go find what is what. Normally, you would want to have the explanation with the table. That would be useful. Well, anyway, I think that's fine. Uh, oh, they talk about model calibration. Uh, I think it's in the appendix. Oh, here. So basically, they, they want to make sure that the model is well calibrated. At MPLAM, we spoke about calibration a lot uh, during the early paper club days. We had a few calibration papers also. Uh, so, but basically, uh, we want to put the 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 actual uh, values of, of whatever we want to calibrate and the predicted ones. Uh, so on x and y axis, and we want a straight line here. Okay. If it's, if the if the line here is not on the diagonal, it, so your your model is either overconfident or underconfident. Either way, it's not great. You want to be right on the diagonal. And then they say the model is fairly calibrated, and that's important uh, because um, because we don't want the model to to be overconfident or underconfident. Um, I'm not entirely sure why exactly calibration fits in this context, but they do measure that. Oh, they do because they do it because GPT 4s technical report uh, goes into the detail about calibration, and then they 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 were inspired by by that report. Maybe we should read the technical reports for another time. Um, cool. Any comments here? So just uh, what are they? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Jaron. I say, what are, what are they calibrating exactly? Like, what probabilities? The probabilities of certain, like, output tokens or? Yeah, the, the tokens come with probabilities, right? Yeah. The the output tokens, yeah. I should have said that. Yes. Um, I guess it's here. Uh, align, alignment between models predicted probabilities and generating specific text and the actual likelihood of the text being correct. So that's basically the probabilities of the of the I think there's the tokens. Uh which reminds me about the semantic uncertainty paper, which was a temp with a paper club before, uh, where they look at the different probabilities. But that's a kind of different point. I think here it's about uh, probabilities of the of the tokens, correctness of the tokens. The only thing I could think of is maybe mm -hmm. um and maybe this is completely wrong, but maybe it's like because you're trying to do molecule optimization, mm. you want a calibrated model so that you can get a variety of answers. Because if it was like overly certain all the time, it'd probably only give you the same answer all the time. Mm. Maybe, I don't know. That's, I'm not even satisfied with that answer, mm. but it's just an idea. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Like the, there is no motivation why it's important for this context, except for they say that they say, it's inspired by the calibration analysis in the GPT-4 technical report. So it's like GPT-4 did that, so it do that too. Kind of. And then, uh, oh my, computer is a bit stuck. Oh. So they say, uh, not, not just because they did that, but they showed that calibration, good calibration is important for mo good model performance in general. I think that's the, that's the only reason. Um, here, right. Okay. Um, a few more results about. We are still talking about the continuous, uh, continuous pre-training. By the way, there is no optimization. There is no fine-tuning yet, right? Um, and then they say uh, if you look at figures one uh, a, one b. So now those are the calibrations. We want the table with performance metrics, right? Uh, so these are the um the property predictions uh from from each model so you have the smallest uh, smallest uh chem lactica models and slightly larger uh chemo models uh trained on so those are two two billion parameter models but i think those are trained on more or less data i think that's what it means um and then we have multiple properties and interestingly this the smaller models do pretty well, um, which is encouraging. Um, right. So those are the RMSE metrics. Um, 
And I think in brackets, I'm not sure why they have the, in the brackets. So it's not very clear what the table was, but those are the RMSCs from the predicted properties uh, to the to the actual one. Is there a comment? Yes, Damien. Yeah, I would say that the bracket is the RMSC corrected for mean. So if you look at the table, um, uh -huh. yeah. Well, it's really the same numbers, right? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay, um, there are some more results here. Uh, they do also an ablation study uh, to check the, how each part of um, so a chain of how how important chain of thought this repetition penalty or the suppression thing they did is is useful. So that's the ablation study to to make sure that every technique they use is actually useful. Uh, that's, that is the case. Uh, I guess some of them are more useful than the others, but uh, generally um, you have, you want all, all, all those techniques used okay. for all for all three models here. Okay. Now we do the supervised fine tuning part, right? So we had the continuous pre-training, but now we are we are doing a supervised fine tuning. Um, uh, so we can uh, generate uh, um, uh, gen gen uh, generate properties or predict properties, okay? And uh, and we do that uh, using uh, the pre-calculated properties. So we now the 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 target is to predict the property correctly, rather than generate new molecules. Okay. Um, so results are here. Yes, those are the results. Um, so those are different benchmarks. So the so oh, this, I guess that's important. They find you know, on 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 the on the chemical the data set, but then they uh, evaluate on different benchmarks, right? So there is no crossover, hopefully. Um, Right, again, as you can see, the smaller models even perform best. This is the, uh, the coolest part, I think. Um, so a lot of times you don't need even like 2 billion parameter models. Um, and then this is another benchmark. Um, again, smaller models do better most of the time, even if they are not the best. Like even if you actually, if you look at their errors, the performance is really the same, right? Doesn't, these are all the same numbers. If you if you uh, look at the errors. So, uh, Damien? Yeah, I was wondering, um, I know they've used uh, um, like what, one of the chemistry data sets, but do you know, uh, did they report how, how large this data set is? Like how many data points? It's like 100 million? I think it was the beginning. Um, I think 100 it's million. million yeah. Um, this one, right? 100 yeah. million molecules. Yeah, I was wondering because there is a relationship between um, model size and the amount of data that is required to, to attain mm. good performance, like one of those scaling laws, mm. uh, which probably means that this may have not been enough data to make the larger models mm -hmm. better. Yeah, I agree. Also, the generated molecules are small. Molecules are, don't have uh, thousands of, uh, of tokens. I agree. Yeah. I, they, they are usually fairly small, uh, which is why small models also work well. Uh, but on the other hand, if, when it comes to optimization, the combinatorial space is massive. Even though even molecules are small, it's the combinatorial space is very large. Like normal optimization uh, is even very hard, right? Uh, yeah, because actually, there is. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I finish what you're saying because I, I interrupted you. Apologize. I was just saying that the, the optimization space is very large. So even even if the molecules are small, the model has to be clever enough to generate uh, valid and desirable molecules. That's the hard part here. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to say is I was because I, I I didn't I don't know if there was ever a definition of small molecule. Maybe all pub pub chem molecules are considered small. 
Mm. Um, but because yeah, yeah, because I was I was thinking that really in PubChem, I know there are molecules that have like even thousands of atoms in them. Mm. So oh, yeah, I just, yeah, I didn't know. Um, I was wondering if they had if there was any like if they're like okay molecules that are above this size we just exclude but they don't say that anywhere so maybe it is literally the whole data set and they just yeah because they're, they're very rare the only... those large molecules mm. in the data set mm. oh, interesting it would be interesting to see the performance on larger molecules because the title says small molecules but then i didn't see anything about filtering out large molecules mm. interesting. Good, good point actually um cool should we talk about optimization um so that's that's the that's the funny part uh, so you know genetic algorithms right uh you have an oracle there is no gradient you generate uh well you calculate the value of something and then you mutate the results uh crossover with uh, two other possible values or crossover then mutate and then and then you have a new potential value uh, uh a value to evaluate with an oracle right um so normally you need to, to understand uh, or no, have knowledge about the structure of the data to be able to cro do crossover and mutation um, um on the other hand um when you have llms uh it's different right you can ask uh, basically from the llm to generate a different to to mutate the output or or to cross over to existing uh molecules uh, or if you are doing prompt optimization maybe you can ask the LM to optimize your prompt a little bit right mutate the prompt uh, if it's better uh keep it right uh, so they are doing this very similar uh, process, process here evolution algorithm uh which means uh it's here the algorithm is right here so the, yeah. this part of it, where they're using this LLM to come up with a similar molecule, I for me, that was the most interesting novelty in the mm -hmm. paper. I was like, this is actually a really interesting combination of uh, an optimization algorithm and an LLM. I agree. Uh, uh, I think it, it, it makes more sense with molecules than it, would, it could uh, with the general prompts, because molecules have more structure, right? Uh, because if you mutate uh, or or uh, crossover um, uh, molecules it's a bit better better defined than saying i have this the text and i have the other text crossover it's it's harder to 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 uh, to make sense of how this you know, genetic algorithm would work for a more general text prompting case but if you're prompting with molecules it's more interesting i think Yes, David. So uh, it's the idea with this algorithm then that um, because the optimization space is so large, like mm -hmm. using regular crossover on the molecules and uh, crossover mutation would just take a very long time to process. So then mm -hmm. is the as the LLM used then as a almost like a heuristic? Well, it is uh, used as a heuristic, but um, without an LLM, uh if you cross over how do you know that you are generating a valid molecule well you can right. you, you have the oracle right if uh, yeah you can a genetic algorithm you can validate if the generated molecule is valid or not but you can't uh ensure that you are generating a valid molecule right yes yeah, so, so you'll, have to, you'll have to iterate through invalid ones which yeah, time. but the space is is massive. You can't uh, if you can do that. You don't need anything, right? You can you can just run a, a any genetic algorithm and hope for yeah. a better molecule. Uh, yeah. The other so part with the LLM, LLM is the description. Right? There is a description there, which the LLM follows when it uh, crossovers and mutates. What do you mean by the description? Like, uh, how is that? Yeah. There's the there's another cool part. Uh, one moment. If you look at this uh, here, there is this property, right? Because we want to optimize also following this property. It's like a vapor pressure, whatever, whatever. I don't know what this means, but this is some 
behavior behavior property of the molecule you want to maintain and the LLM can understand this and generate a molecule that satisfies this property it's not just valid but also satisfies the property that's cool and then there is more they also make make it uh, uh, make the generated molecule for uh, have a good similarity number with the I think with the previous one I'm not entirely sure similar to what I think this would be keep the um, crossovers and mutations uh, not too different from the current molecule but we can uh, look at the algorithm to verify that well you follow a few a few properties here right the, the, that's the important part that the normal uh, genetic algorithm wouldn't be able to do Cool. So this process is basically a genetic algorithm. Uh, you generate few, in a in a loop. You generate a few molecules. Uh, you you take a random subset, uh, and then the, you use this molecule to prompt a sub procedure, which we'll see in a moment, uh, to generate a prompt from a given molecule. Okay, you give a molecule, you get a prompt out. Um, and then you generate uh, new uh, molecules from this prompt using the LLM. Right? If you pass this prompt to the molecule, to the LLM, or LM, they don't call it large, it's just a language model, uh, you get the molecule out. And you do it n times to generate uh, the population of your molecules. Okay? And then you do this update, which is uh, the crossover with the current pool and the new molecules and then you take the top p so there is no mutation really because i guess this is already mutated um now there is this fine tuning bit which is also interesting right it says um if at some point there is no improvement if from the algorithm let's fine tune the language model right and then you do that by generating training samples from the current pool of uh, molecules so you, you we use the same procedure to generate uh, training samples. So this the training samples means um, prompts and molecules. So we can fine tune the language model. Uh, well, continuously train the language model. And then maybe next time it will generate better molecules. Because, because it was stuck on this uh, pool, we are kind of uh, overfitting it on the current pool so make, to make it generate better molecules. Um, which I guess you can do. I, because the language models are not that large, so you can continuously and then the samples are small. It's like a hundred samples, hundred molecules or so. Yes, uh, it seems like the kind of losing out on diversity and like exploration in favor of focusing on a of like drilling down onto a local minimum local minimum. Mm. Maybe, but I mean, but what do you do if the algorithm gets stuck, and, and then what do you do? It doesn't improve anymore, right? Yeah, Maybe but like, it you does know, the population at the beginning, and then it gets stuck much later. If you if you have a much larger uh, n here, right, then you make the population larger, more diverse. So that's the trade-off. Yeah. So I guess then you would probably get stuck or something. To what? I mean, I mean, like they could they could have used some sort of a mutation. Um, hmm. Yeah, there, there is no mutation. Yeah. Uh, um, there should be some sort of, but I guess with the mutation you can't guarantee that the molecule is still valid. Right? How do you mutate? There's like the random generation is kind of a mutation already. One thing I'm thinking is maybe because you know, with fine tuning of LLMs, usually all you're doing is teaching like the correct syntax and probably getting the model to focus on some information it already knew a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So if you use that logic by fine-tuning on the current pool, maybe all you're doing is getting the model to extract more latent inter information from itself, from its weights, mm. that are related to those specific molecules. And mm. maybe that's why it works. Mm. I actually yeah. think this is really another interesting part of the paper because we, we really, rare, I, I haven't seen many works where there's this idea of continuous learning as part of the approach where mm -hmm. you get the model to 
Well, in this case, I think it's focused, but I would like to see one where you're just like teaching it new information all the time. But it's, yeah, it's a novel technique from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Like we don't see optimization with continuous learning. We are actually modifying the weights of the underlying model that often, mm -hmm. at least with LLMs. Yeah, I agree. That's all. This, this one was also, first of all, a bit confusing because I hadn't seen this before, but it makes sense. Here's the way. Um, I was just thinking that um, this fine tuning step, I can't see it in the ablation study. Am I misreading things? So, do they do they uh, do they remove this fine tuning step and check how well it worked without it? Ah, um, I haven't seen that. No, ablation was only for the original for the training for continuous uh, continuous uh, training. Let me check. I don't think there was ablation about that. Um, no, maybe in the appendix. I didn't look at the appendix very carefully, so maybe. Me either. Let me check here. Uh, maybe. Because they wouldn't randomly do it, right? Like, I'm sure it didn't work, and then they were like, oh, let's just fine tune. It would be strange yeah. if they start with fine tuning. Um, maybe. No, the parameters. This is cool. They actually put all the hyperparameters for each model in the table. Very nice. Oh, oh ablation study on the optimization no. algorithm. Um, no. Maybe here? Okay, price for property prediction. No. I think it said table 11. Oh. 11? 10, 11. Uh, yeah, fine tuning, no fine tuning. Yeah, it's here. Great. Yeah. Thank, thank you. The difference is not that much. And also, it's reversed for one of the models, like the relationship is the reverse of what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you look at the error sources, there is not much difference, right? Like, it's really seem very similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Maybe you don't need to find him after all. Okay. That was a good point, Elaine. Thanks. Um, and right. So let's look at the other procedure. So this molecule to prompt. Right. So you give a molecule, you get a prompt out. Um, so there is this if else thing. Basically, if you are uh, generating, it's a bit different from when you are only when you are generating for training. So, so M is null, that means, this is a little bit confusing, but M is null, that means we are only generating prompts, okay? Uh, when M is not null, we actually give an M value, MI, that's the input molecule. We are, then we are generating samples for fine tuning, okay? Similar to MI. I think this is where the similarity thing becomes important because we want to generate new molecules that are similar to MI, uh, but we will use them to fine tune the model, right? So if, if M is null, then we basically just um, sample and generate a prompt, right? I think we generate a prompt for this molecule. But if we give, if we have an input mo molecule MI, then we uh, generate uh, a training samples, which is means new molecules and their prompts, uh, which are similar to the input molecule. I think that's that's what this whole thing does here. And we use this V property uh, for the similarity. Okay. Okay, and a few more experiments uh, for the overall optimization. Um, let's just look at the tables. Because basically, this is explaining the tables. Um, so we have these uh, various metrics. Um, uh, reinvent is uh, is the baseline they use, taken from the uh, other paper. Paper. Um, there is another paper again taken. The results taken to, from this paper. The first three of those. Yeah. Uh, and then GFlowNet also. Uh, because it's all the same benchmark, they can just take the numbers from the other papers. And then they run 
these three algorithms. And now after optimization, you can see that the bigger model actually starts doing better. Again, the margins are so small. It's, it's, we have to actually to look at the errors here, uh, which might mean that, again, the difference isn't negligible. Right? If you do like, like the last one, 0 0.2, 17 and a half, like the error is already large enough to go like overlap with the other two performances. But they are all better than the base baseline. So I guess that's good. Um, cool. Multi-property optimization. Um, right, so they also talk here about the optimization uh, for with multiple properties. Uh, this is another problem. They they uh, they evaluate the model zone. Again, those are uh, uh, the two baselines, the three models we have. Uh, so those are different properties we want to predict, right? So these are um, metrics, and these are the two different uh, properties. Multiple properties. We want the model to predict multiple properties, all three of those. Okay? But again, these models are so much better than the baselines. Like some of these fail. Like look at the difference in numbers. It's like several times better. I thought this one was about how many queries to the Oracle you had to do, right? Um, this, this, yes, one. which is, yes, yes. So this, like, exactly. Sorry, uh, you're right. Uh, how many queries you do, and they want to show that this is so much more efficient than, um, uh, than other methods because they either have to make too many queries that I guess that's what fail means. Um, but yeah, because this optimization approach makes things a lot more efficient. But again, difference between different models, not very much. Even sometimes the smaller model is a lot more efficient, right? Uh, but maybe we should just do, take the small model because it's more efficient. Performance is basically the same, which is good news. What was that a hand? Yes, Damien. Yeah, I was wondering because uh, this one is uh, they, they call it the Oracle burden. So how many times mm -hmm. they have to refer to the Oracle for verification? I guess. Um, did they mention anything about like wall clock time on how long does the do these two actually? How do they compare? Because one could be really slow but have low Oracle burden, but at the same time another one could be really fast but have high Oracle burden. Wait, the speed is just the number of Oracle calls, right? There is nothing. Oh, because there is fine tuning in the middle. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Let's check. And no. also, that I think that because no. it's molecule optimization and it's kind of targeted at drug discovery, there the mm -hmm. Oracle would be like someone in a lab or a robot in a lab actually making the molecule and then testing it, which is probably like, if anything, quite expensive um mm. but alone time consuming so that's probably why they want to reduce the number mm. of uh, evaluations like that's their main metric mm. actually they the oracle is also called for fine tuning but only once mm. yeah well, i guess this is also the main uh, metric but i don't see any any measure of time clock time that's a good point um cool maximization with similarity constraints uh right so th this is the part when um they want to optimize the uh the do they, they want to run on, they want to optimize in a way that the generated molecule has high qed and is similar to some given molecule right um so this is a uh, um, thing that we are them trying to find them uh, here, right? Um, yes. So you want to, you're, you're measuring the similarity constraint. So is the molecule similar enough to the given molecule? So because sometimes you want to generate an optimized molecule uh, uh, that is similar enough. And again, uh, they have two benchmarks and the success rate 
called Team Lactica is the small model only. It's almost perfect. So they said we don't we don't want to check the bigger models because this is already perfect. Um, so that's also cool. But I think they all the, the way they measure the the success may may be up to interpretation because I think they say uh, you get to choose this uh, what similar similar means. Right? They, you want to so this similarity is more than 0.4, which may be a bit too low. Uh, but I guess it doesn't matter too much, right? Um, this is probably uh, they took these numbers from another paper, so they just followed whatever the other paper did. Cool. Um, I think that's all. Any other comments? Because this impact and the limitations, this is basic. This is quite standard. You know, people might this will help drug discovery, but people might abuse it. Um, as the normal things as you would see with um, with uh, molecular generation. Cool. I think it's just a very very cool paper. Like the fact that they combine an optimization problem. It's quite a novel. Yeah. I wonder if it's going to spin off into a startup. Oh, it is a startup. I, I try to get the startup, but it's, it's like a scientific startup. It's like a small Armenian version of DeepMind. Uh, they've been around for many years. I tried to get them to present here, but they didn't want to. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll present. It's a cool paper. Um, okay, thanks all. I think thanks, we can thanks, Yeah, all. thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. See ya. Everyone have a good weekend. See you all. You too. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, Ahan. See you guys. Bye. Thank you.